Your Royal Highness, ladies and gentlemen, it is with enormous pleasure that I welcome you to this very special service as we celebrate 200 years of the RNLI. At York Minster, we are honoured to be the hosts of this act of worship commemorating the most remarkable legacy of service to neighbour and community that has benefited people around the coast of Britain for these past two centuries. I bid you a very warm welcome indeed. And I invite you now to sing our first hymn,
They that, the go, they that go down to the sea in ships and occupy their business in great waters, these men see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For at his word the stormy wind ariseth, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They are carried up to the heaven and down again to the deep. Their soul melteth away because of the trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man, and they are at their wit's end. So when they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, he delivereth them out of their distress. For he maketh the storm to cease, so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad, because they are at rest, and so he bringeth them unto the haven where they would be. O oh, that men would therefore praise the Lord for his goodness, and declare the wonders that he doth for the children of men. for children to follow in the footsteps of their parents. But in our case, it was the reverse, and my daughter joined the RNLI first. In 2013, at the age of 17, I was walking my dogs along the seafront with friends when I saw a young man swept off the rocks and into the sea. I instinctively called 999, but asked for the sea police. As I threw him a life ring, within moments the colour coat's lifeboat came into view and plucked him from the raging seas. This was very impressive. I was aware of the RNLI, but until that moment it was not relevant to me, and I had not considered the fragility of life. After the event, I was invited to the station to meet the crew. When I learned that there were no women on the crew at colour coats, I swiftly signed up as trainee boat crew and have never left. Once a family member joins the RNLI, the whole family become involved. When Anna joined, I transported her to service calls. I was roped into fundraising and administrative tasks. And I was eventually appointed lifeboat operations manager in 2022 at Colour Coats. Now, other family members and friends have joined us. We are a diverse family and together we enjoy serving our community. I am now a helm at Colour Coats, the first female helm in the history of Colour Coats Lifeboat Station. I'm in a command position responsible for the crew our casualties and upholding the reputation of our brilliant organisation. I'm also employed by the RNLI as a fundraising manager and like all of you, we live and breathe the RNLI. It is an honour to serve the RNLI and we both love our roles.
I've been volunteering at Cleethorpe's lifeboat station for 11 years. We're a small station in a traditional seaside resort with a D-class lifeboat. There's about 30 of us in the station and we're like a family to each other. We bicker, we fall out, there's not a single one of them I would trust if they were stood behind me right now with a bucket of water. <laughs> but when the pager sounds, we've all got each other's backs. We're there for each other when it comes down to it. We're a humble bunch. Sometimes I think we're more proud of each other than we are of ourselves. That's what I want to talk to you about today. But first, I need to tell you my story. When I was a kid, we always went to Anglesey in North Wales for our summer holidays. I clearly remember every year, my dad would take me around every lifeboat station on the island, giving me some money at each one to put in the box and telling me what heroes the men on the lifeboats were, how selfless and brave, sacrificing their safety for those in peril on the sea. Over 30 years later, those words resonated with me when I saw Banner asking for volunteer crew. I phoned up and I explained that I'd love to help with something, but I'm an IT guy, there's no way I could ever be lifeboat crew. I was convinced to try though. And while the training was tough, I've now qualified as a help, trusted by the institution with their equipment, by my crewmates with their safety, and most importantly, by those who call for help with their lives. My dad passed away five years before I made that call. If anyone had told him during his life that one of his kids would end up in command of a lifeboat, he would never have believed them. But every time I get into my gear, I know how proud he would be if he were still alive. Proud first, anxious, of course, sometimes worried. Like all our families are all our friends are. But in my experience, our alive volunteers are humble. We don't let ourselves feel proud very often. We hold ourselves to an impossibly high standard. We feel the weight of the bravery of those who went before us over the last 200 years. In cork life jackets, rowing through a storm to a rescue. When the outcome isn't good, we blame ourselves, even when there was nothing that we could have done. You're here today as one of over 32,000 current members of the RNLI family, but every individual action by every single one of you Fundraising, engagement, operational, makes a difference. When a hand reaches out to someone in the water, it's one person reaching out to one other person to make them safe. But also with the support and history of the whole organisation behind it. So today, I invite you regardless of your role or involvement with the RNLI, regardless of how long or short a time you've been with us, to feel proud of yourself. If you struggle to do that, for whatever reason, I invite you to imagine that my dad stood here beside me, looking at you, and allow yourself to feel the awe and wonder that he would be feeling, looking at so many brave, selfless, 
amazing people. How proud he would be of every one of you. Please stand. God our Father, we praise you for the work of the Royal National Lifeboat Institution and we give you thanks for the courage, dedication and skill of all those who go to sea ready to help others in distress. We remember the tradition of service in which the institution stands. We honour the memory of those who gave their lives attempting to rescue others. And we give thanks for all who in any way have helped and supported the work of the institution throughout the years of its existence. Amen.
that they would therefore praise the Lord for his goodness and declare the wonders that he doeth. May I speak in the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You probably know the story of the very capable gardener who bought a rundown cottage in one of those picturesque villages that regularly feature on the front covers of magazines that expound the delights of rural living. The building was structurally sound, but the property had been unoccupied for some years since the previous owner had died and it exuded an air of shabbiness matched by the overgrown and unkempt condition of the garden. The new owner put his back into the very necessary work of restoration with energy and enthusiasm, and after a few months there had been a huge transition. With a mown lawn, existing plants trimmed back and many new plants in place, the garden had been transformed into a place of nigh-on perfection and utter beauty. One sunny summer's morning, the new owner was sitting on a well-positioned bench in the garden, enjoying a cup of coffee and surveying all that had been achieved when the vicar of the parish walked past and stuck his head over the garden gate. Gracious, he said, your garden is looking wonderful now. It's so heartening to see what man and God can do when they work together. Well, came the swift reply, I don't know how much God had to do with it, Vicar. After all, when he had it to himself, it looked pretty awful. This afternoon, of course, our thoughts are focused not so much on what happens on the land, but what happens at sea. And that can be a much more intimidating business, as much of what we have already heard in this service has reminded us. The beloved hymn we have just sung, complete with its special lifeboat verse, speaks of the angry tumult, of wild confusion, and of the foaming deep. Scary images of chaos and danger not scenes of comfort or beauty. And that famous hymn echoes words penned well over 2,000 years before its author was born from that portion of Psalm 107 that was read to us. For the psalmist, he also knew of the dangers of the stormy wind and the waves that it could produce. What is slightly more unnerving is that the psalmist also speaks of the role of God in the dangers to be found on the seas. Now at first this might seem quite straightforward. Many people across the ages have looked at the vastness of nature and felt the presence of God. But this psalm goes beyond the awe and wonder approach to the natural world. For its author, is happy to attribute to God direct involvement, not just in calming, but in creating the storm in the first place. We were told it is at his word that the stormy wind ariseth. Let's be honest. The nature of God as portrayed in those eight verses is really rather fickle. This God snaps his fingers and a storm flares up, causing those at sea to reel to and fro until they are at their wit's end. And only then, if asked nicely enough, the same God maketh the storm to cease. If you were just beginning to wonder whether this God sounds suspiciously like the playground bully you tried to avoid when you were at school, you were not, in my opinion, very far wrong. Which means we might have to do just a little bit of work to understand why it is that we should, therefore, praise the Lord for his goodness. 
because it's a pretty narrow definition of goodness that understands it as simply being the relief which comes when a bully chooses to stop tormenting you. And indeed, I would feel really rather nervous about attempting to honour the selfless work of the 5,600 crew volunteers and the 3,700 shore crew volunteers to honour them in a building like this if all they were really doing was trying to rescue seafarers unfortunate enough to have been picked on by a callous or angry god who was just having a bit of fun at their expense. But there is a reason that the collection of writings we refer to as the Bible is rather a weighty tome, for the Hebrew and Christian scriptures cover over a thousand years of reflection on the nature of God and of how God interacts with the world and with humanity. And as you would both hope and expect, the understanding of the nature of God and of how the world works matures substantially over those centuries. And of course, for those of us who are Christians, it comes to its fullest revelation in the story and the person of Jesus. For the hard but undeniable truth is that the fallen world in which we live is challenging and dangerous, both in terms of horrors committed by corrupt, greedy and violent human beings, and also in terms of what we usually call natural disasters. And the real good news of the Bible is that God is not some moody and immature supernatural being who turns storms or earthquakes or droughts or famines on or off, depending on whether he got out of bed on the right side or not. The good news that we are gathered to celebrate this very afternoon is that God cares about us cares about us so much that he allows himself to be born into this world, becoming just as vulnerable as you or I, to show the world that when disaster and death occur, which inevitably they do, they do not have the final word. And the God whose love inspired, well, inspired the building of this vast, wonderful cathedral, the God whose journey traces its steps from a humble crib in Bethlehem to a cross atop a skull-shaped rock in Jerusalem. The God who encounters danger and death without which there could be no resurrection. The God who is so intimately involved with the totality of human experience that he knows firsthand fear and pain and death, this God endures all this, as St John puts it in a famous passage in the fourth gospel, so that the world might be saved through him. Not some of the world, not the people who vote Tory or the people who vote Labour, not the people who hold this passport or that passport or don't have a passport. Not the people whose skin is this colour or that colour. Quite simply, God rolls up God's sleeves. God walks the roads that we walk and, more relevantly today, God sails the seas that we sail and endures the dangers we endure because God loves loves without judgment or discrimination. And in the vast economy of God, even though there are storms and tempests aplenty, in the great economy of God, love wins. Which is, to my mind, what is modelled in the remarkable work of the Royal National Lifeboat Institution. For when a lifeboat crew goes out to save frightened humans on a capsizing vessel, those volunteers don't demand to know 
why the people were daft enough to get into trouble in the first place. They don't check people's documents or bank balances or voting records before offering them the hand of hope of rescue. They don't cross-examine those who are in need to make sure that they are worth saving. Without judgment, they just get out there into scenarios that people like me who are unused to nautical life would find utterly terrifying. They just get out there to offer unconditional assistance to those in great need. So when the psalmist suggests that we should therefore praise the Lord for his goodness and declare the wonders that he doeth, I hope that we can see the big picture, the enormous picture of a divine love that intervenes in the world, not by flicking some heavenly on-off switch that controls the waves, but so much more wonderfully and importantly by unconditionally walking alongside the world, both in its joys and its fears, and by showing the world that terror and disaster and even death do not have the last word. It's so heartening to see what men and women and God can do when they work together, says the vicar to the gardener. And what we celebrate today in the glorious bicentennial of the RNLI is a wonderful example of just how it is that we can emulate God's getting alongside God's children to love them and save them unconditionally. For that is what has been happening around Britain's coastline these last 200 years, day by day by day, as the storms come down and the waves arise and hearts fail in terror. That's the point when countless petri petrified seafarers have discovered that they are not alone and that people whom they don't even know are risking their life for them. Long, long may it continue. And may we all say, oh, that they would therefore praise the Lord for his goodness and declare the wonders that he doeth. Amen. Good afternoon to you all, and there is a lot of you. Uh, my poem, All Hands. Two centuries passed, and still, this Bambra's cannon echoes firmly in faint hearts. They hasten into boiling seas. Hands that rode and reached out to the hopeless in storms that rage now, but in memory, still reach for them today. Just as ore, sail, steam and diesel have pushed us ever on, so too we lean upon a crew of thousands, the givers of time, who raise the seaman's chant with every freely given coin. 
And let us remember those who gave their very last, whose valour was their parting gift. Bid safe return to those who now keep watch, and in time place our hope in the hands of those who in storms to come will heed the shout and turn the bow to danger. Let us pray. Merciful Father, all things in heaven and earth are held within your loving care. Look with favour upon the Royal National Lifeboat Institution. Protect and bless the crews of all our lifeboats, our lifeguards, and all who risk safety to bring help to others. Guide all who work for the institution as volunteers, supporters or staff, that they may be faithful to the vision of its founders, so that it may always be seen as a beacon of hope and light to those who find themselves in peril on the seas. Through the same Christ to whom you and the Holy Spirit be honour and glory, now and forever. Amen. Wherever we are, wherever we may be, we are one crew, ready to save lives. 
We are powered by passion, talent and kindness, like generations of lifesavers before us. This is our watch. We lead the way, valuing each other, trusting in each other, depending on one another, volunteering to face the storm together, and knowing that with courage, nothing is impossible. That has all has driven us to save everyone we can. It's what makes every one of us a lifesaver.
Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honour all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit come upon you and remain with you this day and evermore. Amen. It's a great privilege to be with you here today as we give thanks for those who've given so much in the name of saving lives at sea. Their time, their courage, their support, and in some cases, their own lives. 200 years ago, Sir William Hillary, founder of the Royal National Lifeboat Institution, wrote a plea for volunteers to risk their own lives for those whom they had never known or seen. Good people responded then and have continued to do so for two centuries. Men and women showing extraordinary courage, supported by volunteers and donors who hold the RMLI's values dear. For a charity to have survived 200 years based on the time and commitment of volunteers, and on the sheer generosity of the public who provide kind donations is truly remarkable. It is thanks to their dedication that the RMLI has survived the test of time, including tragic losses, funding challenges, two world wars, and more recently, a global pandemic. Since 1824, our volunteers have saved more than 146,000 lives around the coastlines of the United Kingdom, Ireland, the Isle of Man and the Channel Islands. We will never forget the hundreds of RMLI crew members tragically lost when providing this service. I would therefore like you to join me today in commemorating all those who have selflessly given their lives to help save others and freely given their time, energy and passion for our cause since 1824. On behalf of the whole RMLI family and the communities we serve, I extend my heartfelt gratitude to all those remarkable volunteers. Let us also celebrate the achievements of today's crew volunteers, communities and supporters. They provide a world-class life-saving service based on 200 years of learning, expertise and innovation. They are people of all ages, active all around and across our nations, from diverse backgrounds, united by the RNLI's vision to save everyone we can. This is a vision which depends on the lifesavers and supporters who will take the RMLI into its next century and beyond. So, as we give thanks for all those who have gone before, it is our sincere hope that their achievements inspire a new generation of courageous, generous and selfless people who will continue to help to save lives at sea.